but uh, there's times when I have to kind of work with it and move with it when I'm preaching and teaching. Welcome to you. We're glad you're here to worship with the family at Ranger. I want you to understand that we're here to honor the Lord God and to be a part of that family and that fellowship that's in Christ Jesus. And I'm blessed to be a part of the opportunities. Uh, Gary and I tell each other we're brothers twice because we got the same name. But he's a Murphy and I'm a Montgomery. Uh, they're gone today, and I'm always glad to come and share with you and visit with you. Be reminded that all over the world there are people in the name of Christ Jesus gathered and worshiping and giving praise and thanksgiving and remembering what it means to be a child of God. Be reminded also that the understanding of my life and yours, that my life, my, your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God through Christ Jesus. When Paul says, I don't live anymore, Christ Jesus now lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, Galatians 2, 20, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's really the blessing that we enjoy that connects us. When you and I study together today, we're going to look at John chapter 9, the Gospel of John chapter 9. We're going to talk about a miracle that occurred in the ministry of Christ, many did, you remember those medicals in John chapter 9 were concert, con confirming the word with the signs that fall. And in the process of that, keep in mind and be reminded of what it means to be a child of God and to understand those great and powerful uh, miracles that came to us by the will of Almighty God. And be sure that you understand what those mean to us in a precious way in our lives. It means that you and I have that which confirms the word. Those pictures that Jesus demonstrated were real. When this man was healed, there were so many questions that occurred at that time. I often have people say, well, Brother Gary, wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody's eyes could be restored and suddenly no longer were they blind or they had an arm that was withered and suddenly it began and was immediately healed? Well, again, you and I want what we want and we want life to be perfect. And if we really had a way to give God instructions and explain to him how it ought to be, we'd say, why did you leave Jesus here to do all these miracles? We could have lived forever. And we would still have followed him. But he said, oh no, I've got a plan. And that plan required him to leave and you to come. Meaning, you become children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So in this story, there's one who we understand and believe that was blind from birth. And they question everything about it. We're going to read it out of here together. And, and here's the question I want you to answer when I get through preaching to you today. How indeed were my eyes open? And are my eyes still open? You see, it's possible that you and I can have good eyesight and be blinded by the world. It's possible that we can see physically, but spiritually, we don't see anything at all around us because as those folks used to say, sometimes we can't see what? The forest for the trees. Everything just kind of comes together. And in this very dynamic but overwhelming and sometimes contradictory world, there's a lot of things that you shake your head and say, I don't understand. And I, what I don't understand, somebody said, I don't trust. But what I don't trust, I ought not to follow. So in the story that we see here, there's some questions that arise. I just want you to kind of get your mind focused with me. Let's do a little reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. The Gospel of John, chapter 9. And, and, and you'll get this picture for just a moment here. We're going to read the first four verses of John, chapter 9. Are you with me? Let's go. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and the disciples asked him, saying, <coughs> Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, You go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he sent and washed, and the Bible says, came back able to see. 
Now, just go a little bit farther over. I want you to, to get the whole picture of this thing and to begin to look at it. Go to verse 24. Don't get lost with me now. Just stay. I'm giving you the, the front end and the back end. We're going to talk about this together. In verse 25, he will say, So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus Christ. And verse 25 says, He answered and said, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, I was blind, and now I'm able to see. I grew up in Graham, Texas, kind of across the road, up toward Oklahoma. Uh, there's lots of old struggling oil wells still over there, and I was about to die when I was a kid. Poked cattle and cattle out over there, and mowed yard did whatever I could. That died when we were young. But there was a man who fascinated me. I would go and stay with my grandparents at the West Apartments, downtown on the west side of the mall. And uh, we would uh, be there on the Friday and Saturday. And sometimes as I got older, I'd be down there even on my bicycle doing errands and later working. His name was Joe Fredette. He was a veteran of World War II. A tall, straight man who had a white cane with a red tip. And I watched him leave his house three blocks away. Happy that cane. He knew when to stop, when to start. He could even hear people coming by and wave and call their name by the sound of that old truck. When he got across that old double square ground, he knew that old brick street, and knew which side of the court has to get to, where to turn, how to go up the steps to the candy and soda pop stand that he ran over on the north side of the square and in the north side of the courthouse. If you went up there and handed him a coin, he could feel it and he'd give you a proper change. If you handed him a bill, he would say, pardon me, but what denomination is that? And if you wanted to, you could lie to him and say, sir, that's a $5 bill. But I never heard of anybody do it. Here's what fascinating. He could see people in the world and see everything around him in an amazing way. I used to talk to him as a young kid. He would say, son, you know those big ant trees right down the street here? My granddad went there. Yo, how do you know those trees are there? Oh, I've known them all of my life. I want to speak to you this morning about keeping your eyes and understanding that sometimes in the process of life, we like to blame God, blame our parents, blame something for the fact that we spiritually have become struggling and maybe even weak. And maybe sometimes along the way we want to say, well, who did this? You see, it's interesting to read this story. They say he's blind from birth. And when the whole process starts and suddenly, those little clay balls were put on his eyes, and he washes according to instruction. You see, when you receive a miracle from the Lord, when you receive a blessing, you've got to do something to fulfill the understanding of it. We forget that today. Every good gift and every perfect gift is still from above, James chapter 1. Coming down from the Father of life, where there can be no variation, either shadow cast by turning. That's still a principle. We've got to do something with it. It's kind of like the talents in Matthew 25. If you stick it in the ground, you didn't do nothing. But if you began to use it, it would develop and multiply. I want you to see that here, there was a blessing that could come, and they wanted to say, well, what is it that this young man did? He just went down to the pool, by the way, a specific pool that Jesus mentioned in Siloam, and washed his eyes, and lo and behold, he's seeing now. What happened? They said, well, there must be a hope here. They wanted to ask questions. They wanted to try to come to some understanding. It's interesting in the whole story that when they get right down to it, first, first of all, the conclusion is, well, he, 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 his parents or he must have seen. You know that in that age and time, and I've had the privilege, Sandra and I both of being in, in Africa, 
and over in that part of the country, they still believe that most of the sickness that comes is because of something bad that I did. I messed up. I didn't do something right for somebody, and God sent me this problem. In fact, when they get really sick, even brothers and sisters in Christ, when I would be there teaching and preaching, they would say, well, Brother Gary, I have to confess to you. I went to the old witch doctor in the village because my child was sick. And I wanted to know what I needed to do. And he'll say, well, you pay me so many of this, and you, 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 you hang two chickens, and you drain the blood, and blah, 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 and so forth. And that old witchery and that old witchcraft is still all over the world where people somehow think that God is causing problems to come to us when difficulties come. Just be reminded. Let no man say when he's tempted. I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted, neither tempted he any man. God doesn't create temptations and problems for us in order to get our attention. This boy was born blind because of physical difficulty. His parents didn't sin. He didn't sin. You even go over to James chapter 5, and you're here and talk about the idea uh, that this, this prayer will save the sins of the one who's involved. And, and we understand that that still is a part of that culture. And, and you see, uh, it, it's not a matter of confessing your faults one to another and praying for one that you may be healed. And the effectual fervent right, the prayer of righteous men availed much. We know one thing for sure. God did not send sickness and difficulty at this point. Jesus explained the will of God is going to be made manifest in him, and his blindness is going to be something that will demonstrate the light of the world and what God means to us. So I want you to think about it. You can say, well, uh, ha ha have you ever really had a time when you couldn't say, oh, I know if you're old enough, you've had your eyes dilated, you couldn't see it, some of those things that came along the way. But you know, one of our greatest assets and one of the abilities and one of the senses we have is our eyesight. I've often said, and maybe it's true with you, if you had to lose your hearing, lose your speech, or lose your ability to see, if you could choose which one would it be, I think I'd still want to be able to use my eyes, be able to get around. I love to read, be able to know what I'm doing, what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling all around us. But you see, with this boy, who I think was grown in the ministry of Jesus, we often think about children, but I think he was a grown man who was fighting himself in time and a struggle of life. And Jesus Christ uses this to confirm the word in a powerful way. You, you know, in Isaiah 59, I marked it. i got to go back over here and get it. There it is. Isaiah 59, the Bible says, we look for light and there's darkness for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as a dead men in desolate places. What's he talking about? He's talking about that your sin, Isaiah 59, 1 2, has separated you from God. And because those choices that break the rules and laws of God that make a difference in your happiness, in your salvation, in your life, he said, you're broken at the wall like a blind man. I've seen people who could not see and were struggling to find their way. It's a frightening thing to see that kind of situation. I've been in situations where people were walking and needed help, and I was privileged to learn a little bit about it, and I'd say, you put your hand on my shoulder, and you walk where I walk. And we'd walk together, and you say, well, how did you know they needed help? I offered and they took it. Can I help you? We want to walk with me. Yes, put your hand here. Let's walk together. I just want you to think about it this morning and say, I don't think I'm groping, Brother Gary, but there's times when I find myself thinking I understand God, but Matthew 13, 13 through 15 will say, sometimes I'm seeing and I'm not seeing. I'm hearing and I'm not hearing, and I don't understand because I closed my eyes and stopped up my ears and covered up my heart. My heart's wax gross. I covered my, less happily I should see with my eyes and hear with my ears and understand with my heart and should change. And he can heal. You see, we can speak about physical blindness and spiritual blindness. They asked the old gentleman in a large congregation years ago, 
who was blind and could not hear. They said, Brother Wild, do you, you don't need to have to come. You can't get around well. You can't even hear the singing or the preaching. Why do you come? And they were speaking loudly in his ear. He said, he wrote it down. He said, I come because I want everybody who knows me to know whose side I'm on. Maybe that's a question for you and me to think about. I need my eyes wide open. I need to be able to see and understand. And I need to understand that as the story unfolds, first of all, he's recognizing he has a problem. And they bring him to Jesus. You see, if we don't understand we have a problem, then likely we're going to get a cure. Uh, I don't like to go to the doctor, and I sure don't like to take pills, and I'm in the middle of that right now. Since I've spoken to you, I've had a couple of stints put in my heart. I told him the PVC was not going to make me better. The doctor said it's not PVC, but I tried to activate it a little bit. I didn't know I had a blockage, and they ran this cap, and by the way, they had to come in there and open up some things, and I'm taking more medicine. I'm just telling you the idea of taking medicine and somehow the idea of working out my own situation. Sometimes, I close my own eyes and I create my own, but I've got to understand the problem and accept the cure if I'm going to get things straightened out. In Luke 23, or rather Matthew 23, but again in, 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 in Matthew 15, uh, about 14 to follow, he was saying, if the blind, remember this, if the blind lead the blind, what will happen to them? They'll both fall in the ditch. They'll both fall in the ditch. You ever stepped on a post hole that didn't have a post in it? Sure does get your attention. And he said, you better be sure who you're following and keeping your eyes open because of the situation that's happening in life and all the things around us. When he says it in, in the words recorded, be sure your sin will find you out. Number chapter 32, 23. We know that you and I are people who are confronted with sin all around us. Listen to this. We face sin. We have to learn separation that separates us. That sin from God. And then if we're not careful, sin will lead to separation. Separation leads to blindness. Physical eyes are open. But our spiritual eyes no longer willing to see. Let's look at another verse. Get your Bible open with me again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I just want to read this one with you. Sometimes I have to tell you, sometimes I've got to read this to you. But these are key verses. Key verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 through 6. You got your Bible open? You're ready to read? Let's go. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. How, how can we be blinded by what the world calls their message of their gospel? Well, it's something that occurs every single day. I don't know about you. I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired about politics lately. Are you? I don't want to see anymore, hear anymore. It's all full of people trying to be nasty and hateful and, and critical and accusing with everybody else around them, thinking they're going to gather up the world and they're all going to be a, a leader for us in the salvation. And mercy me, God bless. I'm just saying, be careful. People right now are blinded with the idea that somebody's going to do something for me. We're in a society that says, give me, give me, give me. I want programs that provide for me everything that they can provide. Please understand you can be blinded with that kind of social gospel. The Bible taught us if a man will not work, he need to all eat. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And when we understand it, he said, whatever work you find to do, do it with all of your mind. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. I'm telling you, we are in a time 
that is dangerous. And people right now are blinded by money and power and the opinions of others. They've got folks that are actors that don't have any character nor any control of their lives coming on saying, you ought to vote for Hillary, you ought to vote for Trump because I think they're the one. Please don't insult me to think your intelligence is enough to give me instruction. I need to open my eyes and begin to study. I need to accept the cure. I admit the problem and I submit to his cure and I listen to his instructions. At my house, when I was a boy, we had about three kinds of medicine. Remember? Yours may have been cash for ours was syrup, pepsin, or cash for oil. The, the, the other was, well, it was a uh, uh, camp oak and ink. Mama bought it, and it was good for everything. And the other one was a good bottle of alcohol. I ripped my knee open out swimming in a horse tank with a bunch of kids in a pasture behind us. And she got me to the house, and I'd have been stitched up three times if I'd been in this day. She sat me down, washed it out good, poured that thing full of alcohol, and then she got what we call the monkey blood. Remember? I don't red stuff, poured it full, and took tape and taped that leg up and changed that bandage every day. You can't find the scar. I asked a doctor who replaced my knee, and he said, Who stitched that? And I said, The Lord did. <laughs> I'm just saying there's a cure. And sometimes we'd rather run and let somebody else solve the problem rather than deal with the understanding of what really is happening in our lives. When I submit to the cure, I submit myself to care in Him. First Peter 5 verse 7. He says, Casting all your care upon Him because He cares for you. I did 12, 15 hours a week for 25 years of, of, of family and intervention counseling. Spent a lot of time with alcoholics, people with drug problems, addicted to many other things in life. Tried my best to be a friend who could show them the way and give them some life. They would all say to me, just tell me how to turn it over to the Lord. They'd been listening and reading. Some of them had been in jail and dry out units and gone through the AA. And, and I'm not against alcoholics. No, there's some great thoughts from the Bible included. Well, let me tell you something. Whether I'm lying or I'm cheating or I'm stealing or I'm taking drugs or I'm drinking alcohol or I'm involved in sexual immorality or pornography, God doesn't want it. You can't give it to God and get rid of it. Now, you may want to argue that point. I'll be glad to argue with you. Now, you can lay it down and walk away from it and God will fill your mind and your heart and your life with something that will cause that no longer to be important and have power over you. But you can't give it to God. I've had them come to me and I, I preached in prison and they say, I just been praying to the Lord to take away my addiction. Well, you can quit praying, son. He's not going to take it. He don't want it. In this case, God wasn't interested in figuring out a way to have people praise because this boy gave it to the Lord he said to him, you do what you're told and go wash your eyes and you'll be able to see. I'm afraid of that head. We're caught up in a kind of a world that I don't know what the name of the religious group might be that you want to mention, but so many of them are determined that we've got to have a dose of Pentecostalism, a dose of the healing power, a dose of the direct operation of the Holy Spirit to be able to connect with God. Now listen, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, 21 he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And then you're going to describe, they say that like, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name do mighty, mighty miracles and works. And he said, I'll, I'll say to them, I don't know you. Get away from me. Depart from me. I never knew. Now, I study that with people, and they'll say, Brother Gary, everything good blesses God, and God's in favor of it. I know some people in this world today who indeed are atheists. <laughs> who declare and deny that there is no God, and they do good things. But they'll be condemned in the sight of Almighty God. Let me tell you something else about this story in, in John chapter 9. They questioned his parents, and they said, we don't know. They said, well, go ask the man. And they go ask the boy first, 
and they're seeking to try to condemn Jesus, and they said to him, and I read it to you here at the beginning, they said, son, what happened? How did that all this occur? He said, I don't really know who that man is, or I don't know everything about it. There is one thing that I'm sure of that I couldn't see and now can. I can take you and show you people who are elders and deacons and gospel preachers in the Lord's church, active and serving, who were blinded for years before their eyes finally got open. And it was not a miracle that you would call it, or I, like this one in John 9, it was the Word of God being able to cause the eyes of their understanding to be open. Ephesians chapter 1. With your Bible, will you go with me please? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Yeah, I'd like for you to go read with me too. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now watch verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that is, they are open and full of light, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of his glory, of his inheritance of the saints, what's the exceeding greatness of his power to us for who believe according to the work of his mighty power. You say, what's that say? It's saying that sometimes it takes a while for people to get their eyes open. Some of us were raised in the church and never got our eyes open until we were grown. And we began to deal with the devil and with the wall and we were groping with our eyes. Isaiah 59, we couldn't find a way. And suddenly we said, you know, there's got to be a way for me to realize how to deal with my problem. And I laid it down and went back to the roots of the Word of God. I can just say to you this morning, as we study together, as we study <coughs> time together, I'm convinced that we all have a burden to bear and a hill to climb. I used to often go over that scripture in 2 Corinthians where Paul describes chapter 13, this thorn in the flesh, and we've always gone into all kinds of assumptions. And, and he writes about, see how large letters are right with my own hand, so we assume it's his eyes. I don't know. All I'm saying is, he said, I asked God three times and tried to lay it down, this physical problem of mine, and he said, no. He said, listen now, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power, the old King Jesus, will be made perfect in your weakness. See, it, 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 it'll preach a sermon the way you handle the situation. My mother was widowed at 36. Before we scratched and made it. And later, people would say, we'd shake our heads and say, how is that old girl going to make it within four kids? She made it. She made it because she knew that it was her place in life and she couldn't change it. I kidded her years ago there was a man member of the church who was a CPA that worked in Texas Electric. And as Mama used to say, kind of and shine. He'd say, Emma, let's go out and eat. We'd say, Mom, go with your teenagers. When I got older, we did a little study regarding families and family life and psychology. I said, Mom, what was in your way? And she said, God said, one man, one woman, one marriage. I had one man, I don't want another. I had to train to put up with it. Why, we could have had all kinds of good life. That old boy, he had financially blessed himself in hard work and a good Christian. She wouldn't do it. And later, people would say, Amazing. How you just offer love successfully in every place to some degree. And I said, It's all because she understood. <coughs> she got her eyes open. You know, the world and the pain and the heart of it and the problem. You all can say that. I've known people who just got angry with God because they had cancer and said, hey, coming back to church, God let this happen to me and through. Mm -hmm. God didn't cause you to have cancer. The Bible teaches it that he's never far from us. 
everything we face, he's able to guide us and he will not allow us to be tempted or burdened beyond what we were able to bear. First Corinthians 10, 13. But I want you to, if you can hear the story of this boy in your mind, say, where do I fit into this thing, Brother Gary? And then I'll hush you. You can go eat. But I want you to say, yeah, we've all got a hitch and a problem. Whether I'm in a situation that's really public or private. Sometimes I just need to say without question, I am going to give the glory where the glory belongs. Remember, three times in this story, if you go back and read it later this afternoon, he'll tell you, you give the glory to God. You glorify, you give glory to God about what's happening in your life and, and the blessings you can receive. I know the Psalms, and you talk about Psalms 10, 11, 12, right in there. He'll, he'll explain it very clearly. Give praise and give glory. It's, it's to praise you, the Lord, that continues over and over again. Uh, you be thinking about it. How you need to keep your eyes open. You see, in Matthew 15, he would say, these people honor me with their lips, with their heart is far from them. Why? Because in vain they did worship me, teaching for doctrine, they're teaching the commandments of men. And, and see, if you, if you get up that there, you'll talk about their eyes are closed. I've got to have this eyes of my understanding in light. And if you read the rest of Ephesians 1, it'll be because this Holy Spirit, that, uh, that assurance, that earnest of our inheritance, opens up my eyes. The more you read the Word, the clearer life will be, and the better you'll deal, and happiness will be yours, because of a God who never leaves you off the subject. I look for the song. It's funny. It's in the old sacred selection, you know, Steve. It says, Open my eyes that I may see. Glitch is the truth. Thou hast for me. Put in my hands a wonderful thing that will one last and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Savior be God. It's in that book. Thank you. You say, God. With whatever my personal needs struggle, personal needs struggle is today, open up my eyes. <coughs> now, I, you know what my old view is? Sometimes we get old. We get my old. I want to see how it takes it. I can't be blind with those. That's what you mean. They went to get food in John chapter 4 after all the experience of the one that well. They came there and said, Lord, so deep. He said, I've got time to eat. I want you to lift up your eyes. Sometimes somebody like tell me to get my eyes back here. Can't see where I'm going. I'm well, looking at the ground. Pay attention. Get your eyes and see what's in front of you. I'm grateful to have you here. I'm grateful to study this morning. If there's a blessing we can share with you in prayer and fellowship so that your eyes can be opened, you first of all have to understand the cure. And it's the grace of Christ Jesus and his promises. You lay the burden down and you come and say, I'm going to ask you for a brand new beginning and I pray for your guidance and strength. We can get this brother or sister that's the invitation of the Lord. And there may be somebody here and it will be a different <coughs> I've never been born of water and spirit. I've never chosen to understand who this Christ is and how to follow him. You, you, you believe in the Lord God. You said you believe that I believe you that I have your sins, John 24. And you repent of your sins on your prayers, Luke 13, 3. And you confess his name, Romans 10, 9, and 10, with your mouth. And then you're very good in the benefits. That's the wonderful, simple, easy plan. And then you rise to walk in your life and you're open. Get that blessing that's needed in your life with you. Please don't believe us. Thank you for staying with me and listening. Let's all stand together for a second.